All right. Thanks so much for taking this time and for spending a beautiful afternoon with us to um, mark almost the end of um, the National Poetry Month. Um, I wanted to welcome you to our last event of the semester in the Meet VC Author Series at the HRC. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Christina Stanchu. I'm an Associate Professor of English here at VCU, and I'm the Director of the Humanities Research Center. I'm delighted to welcome you today during one of the busiest months of the semester, <laughs> the cruelest month for academics. Um, and I'm also very grateful for your attendance. As many of you know, it has been a busy semester at the HRC. Our virtual events this semester have included one workshop on book publishing, three lectures with national speakers, and five lectures with VCU authors sharing their latest books. Um, looking ahead, uh, the HRC will host a graduate student mini symposium on May the 6th on critical race theory and on May the 12th we'll have an open house for HRC faculty. Um, stay tuned for further details in our May newsletter coming to your inboxes next week. For their help in setting up these events and working their magic behind the scenes, I'd like to thank Katie Reagan Palmore, the HRC administrative coordinator, as well as the communications team in the Dean's office, especially Tyler Conrad. And uh, as some of you know, Katie Reagan um, is leaving us uh, very soon uh, to accept an exciting new position. And I wanted to take a little time to thank her, maybe have her on the screen um, to wish her well in her new endeavors and to thank her for all the work she's done for HRC in the last two years. And particularly, it's been a delight working with you since December, Katie Reagan. So many thanks and, and best, best of luck in your new wonderful position. You please know that you'll be missed. Thank you so much. The HRC has really meant a great deal to me and I've loved being a part of it the past two years and you won't get rid of me too soon because I will be attending events in the fall for sure. Um, so thank you for letting me be a part of it. Thank you, Katie Reagan. Thanks so much. Um, I know we have several alumni uh, in the audience. Thank you for your continued support of the HRC. Um, if you're not receiving our new monthly newsletter, please click on the link that Katie Reagan is posting in the chat um, or reach out to me by email. Uh, the format for this event um, is quite simple. We use it for most of our virtual events. Um, I will introduce our speaker briefly and then she will take about 40 minutes to talk to her not only about her latest book but also um, her previous volumes of poetry and then we'll have some time for Q&A. And I encourage you to use the Q&A function to post your questions even during the presentation and I'll try to, um, to bring them up um, in the order in which they are received. So now to my favorite part, uh, one of my favorite parts, uh, the introduction of our speaker. I'm delighted to introduce Professor Kathy uh, Graber to you. <laughs> she needs no introduction to her colleagues and students. Um, she's a professor of English and creative writing here at VCU and, <laughs> drum roll, uh, the English department's new incoming chair as of January, 2022. Kathy is a beloved teacher and colleague who has been teaching at VCU since 2008. In 2019, Kathy was named an eminent scholar in the College of Humanities and Sciences at VCU. She received her MFA in creative writing from NYU and her BA in philosophy from Hofstra University. Kathy is a recipient of many awards, which include a Guggenheim Fellowship, uh, in 2012, the American Academy of Arts and Letters Fellowship um, in 2017, the National Endowment for the Arts Grant in 2011, and many, many other honors for her poetry. Besides the volumes 
The River Twice, published in 2019, and Correspondence, published in 2006. Kathy is also the author of The Inter Eternal City in 2010, a collection of poetry which is a finalist for the National Book Award, the National Book Critics Circle Award, William Carlos Wi Williams Prize, and which won the Library of Virginia Literary Award for Poetry. Today, Kathy will read, uh, among other things, from her recent collection of poems, The River Twice, uh, which is already the winner of the University of North uh, Texas Rilke Prize. Um, and um, I was going to read to you <laughs> something from the publisher's website, but rather than doing that, um, I will let uh, Kathy introduce the volume herself. And um, I would, if we were in person, I'd like you to give her a warm, uh, a round of applause and welcome her to the HRC, but we're definitely doing that virtually. So welcome, Kathy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Thank you to the Humanities Research Center. And I think the Richmond Public Library is also linked into this and their sponsorship. So I appreciate that a great deal. Um, it's very strange to do this on Zoom um, in that I cannot see the participants and so I really don't have any idea who the audience happens to be, who the audience members are. Um, the good thing is that this is going to be recorded um, and so it's possible that um, there's some future audience out there for it that is, that is made up of the one I'm imagining in my mind, even if the audience in the moment is very different. Um, so I imagine the audience to be uh, my some of my loyal colleagues, maybe some of my students, both graduate and undergraduate students, and I, and maybe some members of the community who have an interest in poetry. And so with that audience, which is pretty broad, uh, really in mind, I thought that the something interesting to do might be to talk about um, the evolution of a, of a poet, um, at least how my career has gone. I have a pretty unconventional narrative as in coming to be a poet, um, which is that I was for most of my life a middle school teacher. I taught English. Um, and in my 30s, uh, just through a really fluky thing, I did a favor for a friend and took her class to a poetry festival. And I fell in love with poetry. I fell in love with contemporary American poetry, which I really didn't know anything about before that. Um, there was sort of a tremendous benefit to being 35 or so and deciding to become a poet. Uh, first of all, I didn't have any um, delusions of grandeur. I really didn't expect to be very successful at it. I thought like maybe I would write a few good poems and I could find a journal that would publish them. And then eventually I got to thinking, well, maybe if I get a master's degree, I could stop teaching middle school and I could teach in the community college. So those were the goals that I had in mind. And so the fact that I have um, done better than that is thrilling. <laughs> um, the other part of being older was that I was really aware of how I was learning what I was learning. When, some, when I had a kind of breakthrough uh, in my understanding of proper process, compositional process, um, or how poems can work, I was really, uh, there was a part of my brain that was like, oh, you figured it out this way. Um, and so that I often say to my students is the hardest thing about learning to be a creative writer is to develop that writer's brain. Um, in which you are always sort of looking both at what something is and what it means, but you're also looking at how it's made. Um, and, and that goes not just um, for poets looking at poems or uh, painters looking at paintings or photographers looking at photography. Um, I can share a screen with you. We'll see if this works. Uh, you should be looking at these weird little square boxes. Um, Christina, is that what you're seeing? Yes. Okay. So these are Joseph Cromwell boxes. He's an American assemblagist, um, and he uh, and so he's he. I won't go into any details about his life, but I'll simply say that when I saw these boxes for the first time, 
it was after I had decided that I wanted to learn to write poetry. And when I saw these boxes, especially this one, I had this moment where I said, oh, that's how I want my poems to work. And, and that's a pretty strange, um, yeah, I think most people would sort of say, well, in what way would you want your poems to work like this box? And what I see in this box are things that feel to me um, as though they belong together, but I have a really hard time articulating their belongedness, like what it is that the centrifugal force that is holding them together as a kind of constellation. Um, but I can see that it is both structural and thematic, if that makes sense. So to me, there's like these, the, even though the egg is not quite um, a perfect circle, it still has a circularity and we have this kind of diagonal of round things. The egg and the child feel really connected to me. The moon feels really connected to me in that process because of all the, um, connotations of fertility and femininity that are connected to the moon. This is a this is a very old kind of soap bubble pipe. And so the moon looks like it's a giant soap bubble that's popping out of this um, of this clay pipe, which conjures a sort of whimsicality, but also uh, ideas of childhood and innocence, um, but also being ephemeral because bubbles pop like that. Um, and so there's sort of something weird to think about the moon, which feels to us, if not eternal, at least long living. Um, next, other things that seem pretty fragile, like a soap bubble, like an egg, you know, like childhood. Um, and then that's all juxtaposed up here with these like symbols that seem to be about, I think this is Saturn, right? And so that seems like out in left field, but if you, look up Saturn, you realize that it, that's a fertility, got sat, that, that is a fertility, right? The Saturnalia is the, um, the winter solstice. And so it's the return of the light. Um, and so again, that cyclicality and fertility feel connected, but you have to sort of really like think about the box <laughs> in order to get to that. Um, but mostly just on the surface, I like the way the colors, there's a little bit of blue up here. There's this yellow seems to fit in with all the yellow in here. There's all this white, there's all these circles. Even these are sort of circular, the cylinders. There's little glass circles down here. It's tidy, right? And so poems tend to be tidy. Um, anyway, so this was, um, a breakthrough moment for me. And then it was, here's a little book, if you don't, it's called Dime Store Alchemy, The Art of Joseph Cornell. And it's by the um, former poet laureate, Charles Simic, who is the only, I believe, poet laureate who is not a not born in the United States, born in Yugos the then Yugoslavia. Um, and so he's written this very sweet, it's tiny, it's sort of precious little volume about Joseph Cornell. And he has one of the little prose poems in it, is called Terra Incognita. And, and but next, I'm sorry, I want to actually read from this other one, where chance meets necessity. And so that's my process in writing poems, chance and necessity. Um, and he says, uh, somewhere in New York City, there are four or five still unknown objects that belong together. Once together, they'll make a work of art. That's Cornell premise his metaphysics and his religion, which I wish to understand. He sets out from his home on Utopia Parkway without knowing what he is looking for or what he will find. Today, it could be something as ordinary um, and interesting as an old thimble. Years may pass before it has company. In the meantime, Cornell walks and looks. The city has an infinite number of interesting objects in an infinite number of unlikely places. And that is to me how poems happen, right? You have to sit down at your desk and not know what you're gonna find, right? You may have a line in your head, but it may end up being discarded in the end. It's really a wandering, it's a mental kind of wandering. And things are gonna be pulled into orbit around each other that you can't predict when you go to the desk. So it's an, always a, chance and necessity, a collision of chance and necessity. This is just some wild 
I love this. You don't even need to know what it is, but it's somebody trying to explain the way poems work. And I'm like, okay, yeah, that makes sense to me. That's a Cornell box. This is a poem by Larry Levis that seems to me to be highly associative. I'm not going to read it. We're just going to scroll through it. There it is. This is a this is um, essay lyric essay as constellation by Martha Ronk. And I would recommend that again, this idea that there are there is a constant, rather than a poem having a singular assertion or a theme, it often has a constant, what I call a constellation of concerns. And they are in uh, relation to each other, but they aren't a thesis statement or anything like that. Um, so here she writes, I envision a constellation, perhaps bits, stars, that, look, that looked at long enough produce a coherent figure. Lyric essay, and I would just say lyric in general, allows not only for the musical qualities of language associated with lyric, but also for a stance akin to lying. That is the lyric essay has flights that may start with the event, and there's a list of them, but that spin out from it, not toward narrative or fact, but toward information separate from the words, but towards a constructed and artificial shape dependent on analogy. Like what? I'll let you mull that over. I actually know what I have in mind there and I can, I'm gonna stop screen sharing and just talk confidentially now. Um, I could pull this up for on, it's on the internet. There's a very, there's lectures and there's a, an essay called Analogy as the Core of Cognition by the uh, cognitive psychologist, Douglas, Douglas Hofstadter. Um, and, at one point in this really long gobbly goopy essay on cognitive psychology, um, he tells a story about a confluence of events. And what happened was he, ha so this is only a cognitive psychologist would have a mind that works this way. He met a new person and he wanted to remember her name. So he was trying to come up with a mnemonic device to remember her very strange last name, which happened to have both a K N and N in it. And so he, he struck on the idea that, oh, wouldn't it be fun if I could think of, an, of a, um, a word that had the silent K, like knock, right? Um, and so he's trying to use all, the, all of the letters in her last name to come up with this mnemonic device. Um, and in the process of like doing this and in the process of kind of realizing that it's not gonna work, he's not gonna find a word um, that works that way for her name, he suddenly has this memory of being a young man and having agreed to meet a friend uh, in a foreign city um, on a certain day. This is before cell phones, before internet, before text messaging or Instagram or any of those things. And so he, you know, being a young guy, heads off to the city, steps out of the train and suddenly realizes like they don't actually have a plan, right? Like, to meet somebody in a city on a certain day, even if it's a small town, is not, that's a weird uh, chance, happenstance. So do you wait in the train station? Where do you go to hopefully cross paths? Is this person here already? Have they not come yet? Um, and so he, just, he somehow gets his idea that he's gonna go out to the end of this fishing pier and that his friend will be able to see him at the end of this pier. And, um, and that, so he asked himself, why in the process of thinking of this woman's name, did I have this memory I haven't thought about in decades? And he concludes that they're actually linked below the surface by the unlikelihood of success, right? Like these here are two stories where it's not really likely that things are gonna work out, that somehow you set off on this whimsical mission and the, the probability of a good outcome is pretty low. Um, but he had to think about that for a while, but his brain, some synapse knew that at some level, these things were cognitively linked. And so his brain spit up this memory, even though he, he would not have known that at the time. And so to me, when I read that, I was like, oh yeah, that's how my brain works. Oh, that's probably how all of our brains work. We're always having weird random memories and we don't know why, like, why did I think of that just now? Um, and we, we don't have lives where we can stop and think about that connection, I don't think, um, all the time. But as a poet, it might 
be worthwhile when you're at your desk and you're wandering around and suddenly a memory pops up. I say, hey, put it in the poem. Like this is my first piece of advice is if you have a memory or an idea while you're writing your poem, it probably belongs in your poem. So drop it in there. The worst that'll happen is you'll delete it later on because you can't figure out what it's doing in your poem. And I would say that's, you know, probably a shortcoming of us not knowing ourselves sufficiently and not that your brain misfired. But anyway, so that's the first, that's my, that's my little talk. And so um, with these things in mind, I thought I would go back and look at some of like the very earliest poems that I wrote when I was really just figuring out this Joseph Cornell thing, this thing about how are things connected to each other in non-obvious ways. And so um, I can do this. What I did was I actually made um, screenshots of a bunch of poems from across my three books. And I don't think this, you know, my scanner is a little bit wonky. So I'm sorry that this is not a great, uh, and also that the, if I'm in your corner, you can see it. It has a beautiful, the best thing I can say about this book is that it has a gorgeous photograph by Rosamund Purcell on the cover. And she gave it to me for, gave me permission to use it for free. Um, otherwise my book is very badly um, worn. This poem is called Terra Incognita. And uh, I'm just gonna read it. This is, I wrote this when I was a graduate student and it was a real breakthrough poem for me. I don't think it's a great poem. Um, but it, but it might be the first poem, like the first successful poem I ever wrote, having been writing poems for like five years before this poem. All right. Or having been trying to write a poem for five years before this one. So terra incognita, which if your Latin's rusty means like unknown or hidden land. Uh, my dog does everything three times now. The circling, the sniff. She takes the food into her mouth and drops it takes it, drops it again, until it is all out of the bowl. The little, little kibbles spread around the table legs or spun off beneath the stove. And then suddenly recalling her hunger, she hunts down the ones she can. My father wanted to talk about his death, but I wouldn't let him. I blame the Phillies poor pitching. If the Eagles had had a better draft that year, the outcome might have been much different. I want to deny the way our interest in things can run away. During a kickoff, he told me that it is possible to fall in and out of love many times, sometimes with the same person, sometimes not. He said he could feel himself coming apart. And when my brother began to sob, I told him, dad, look what you've done. You have to stop. The dog is old. She's lost her sense of smell. It's that very, very slow fading away, like walking out into the morning sun, blinking a little, having forgotten exactly how, exactly why. The aromas of chicken soup and liver no longer call her to the kitchen. Yellow cheese on yellow tile eludes her. She snorts and slavers, snuffles an inch or two to the right. Yet on the walk in the park, she does what dogs always do. She buries her breathing head in the leaves and straw, brushes her nostrils against the trunks of trees and hydrants. I've seen her lick the grass and bark, taste the ground, lead snake-like with her tongue. My father wouldn't try. What slipped away, he wanted to release. Twice he asked why my mother wasn't there. He seemed asleep even when he wasn't. He said, the world is hiding and it is. Um, so I think that the, the correlation or correspondence between these things is not a stretch. You're not baffled about like, why is the dad in this poem with the dying dog? Um, yeah, they seem connected. It seems clear why I would have thought about the way my father ended his life when I was watching this old dog um, move into, you know, the end, the end days of her life. Um, I think 
one of the things that I often tell my students about poetry is that it is a very self-conscious genre. Maybe I always say it's the most self-conscious genre, but you know, I bet every every writer says that, every artist says that about their particular uh, medium. Um, so one of the things I think about when I look at this poem now is whether or not it's an elegy, right? Uh, and I think that elegies move from grief to consolation. And, and I'm not really sure that this poem moves really to consolation. I think it moves to understanding. And I wonder that in the 21st century, um, if that's what, that is a kind of consolation to us, that so uh, few things really seem um, that they can be plumbed, like even ourselves, even our lives, even making sense of like, what the heck did I do then? Even if I think this poem is also freighted with regret. Um, you know, I wish I had my father talk about his death. Um, I was just too young. I didn't, I didn't, the, the, my own grief was so overwhelming. Um, I couldn't give him his, his self grief. Uh, and so the, so all of that is in there, but, but I do think about it in terms of it's elegiac uh, or failure to be a sufficiently elegiac, even though it's an elegiac tone. I don't know if it's strictly an elegy. Um, so this is another poem from the same collection. I'm just, don't want to go on too long here. Um, and this one I think is more truly ele an elegy. And this is about my mother's death. I lost my parents, you know, uh, within a decade of each other. Uh, and I also am going to read this poem, even though this is another old poem, because it also has a, an ekphrastic moment, which I wanted to point to as a potential prompt if people were out there. Um, and looking for like, how can I, how, what, what would I do to write a poem? How would I even begin? Or sometimes I don't feel very inspired. My life seems boring. Um, I always say just like find something outside of yourself to put into the poem or begin the poem there. And this poem references the film American Beauty, which I guess, I don't know um, if anybody even talks about this film in very positive ways now because Kevin Spacey, I think won the Academy Award for this film. Um, but none of that had happened when I wrote, or, or the downfall of Kevin Spacey and all of the sort of things that we have come out about his life were not known when I wrote this poem. So, uh, but he's not even mentioned, actually only mentioned in that Benning. All right, the off season. And the, I grew up at the beach. And so this is also close to my heart because the off season is if you live in a tourist town, the, the time of year when all the tourists find all right, after Columbus Day, the shore towns close up so quickly, no one bothers to pull in the signs. Yellow, I'm sorry, postcards yellow all winter in windows beside a shell box, beside t-shirts, plastic shovels and pails. In my mother's house, I prepared to make things disappear. I ask into the phone, who knew it would take so long to settle an estate? All around, the things she saved have their say. But what do they say? Each day they talk more and more only about themselves. Red lettered Chinese fortunes in a drawer as evocative as the dividend stubs around them. Fidelity trust, an old dog will learn new tricks. My mother's x-rays, months past their usefulness. I still drive around with these images in my trunk. Ready Geographs of the dead, memento mori, who doesn't like the way it sounds, or uranium, atomic number 92 that made these pictures possible, all celluloid and heft. The off season, too early, too late for anything you want to do, afternoons end, the last curb before the street gives way to sand. What can we say about our private sadness? The spine, its small white fists, three ribs around a fog of lung, and her brain from ang every angle, although all the thoughts have gone. You will visit a distant land. Night, a rented film, or home movies on vacation from the closet shelf 
in their little yellow Kodak cans, 1964. And my mother is dressed as though life were an occasion, as though fashion were the soul made visible, a claim that holds us because we want to prove all the ways it's flawed. I press rewind and Annette Benning collapses again into hangar clatter, not the last scene, but the almost over. My niece safeguards my dead brother's ties in a plastic pouch that travels with her. But when she opens it, is anything regained? The vanished other, the lost unseeable self, alchemy maybe, half memory, half silk. Marianne Moore's living room, her sofa, her phonograph, the books on her shelf, and the order, in the order she put them, in the permanent, in a permanent, I'm sorry, in their permanent place at the Rosenbach in Philadelphia. And there's a photograph there too of the same room before it was moved. We have to keep checking ourselves. We're so tempted to play the photo, the room, the photo, to keep on discovering what's not there. My mother's heart was so strong, I could see it beneath the blankets bang against the wall of her chest. I must have thought a thing like that will just go on forever. Wind, the house rocks on its shallow footings and home. What frightens me, frightens me here only a little less. The sky seems more. The night heron, duplicitous fisher, bends her long legs to the tide. The stars are brighter but the dark fills up. The wise believe in magic. In a flicker, poof, my mother pops up from below the water of a pool and waves. We want the impossible, we, want, we make the impossible possible, then it changes back. Somehow when we have to bury each other, we do. She has become an Esther Williams bathing cap wide white chin strap neatly snapped around her head, a rubbery halo of elaborate pink blooms. So um, one of the things that elegies do is they often include imagery of resurrection. And so when I look at this poem, I never, I didn't write this poem saying, geez, I'd like to put some imagery of resurrection in my elegy to my mother, right? So that's the worst thing you could possibly, I would say, do when you're in the act of composition is like, oh, if I really want this to be an elegy, I need to do these four things. Um, but when I go back and look at it and I, and I see this poem where she pops up in the, in the family home movies and waves, um, that feels to me like that is a moment of resurrection. What is the home movie if not a resurrection? What is the, re we don't even have VHS tapes anymore. What is the rewind? You can rewind your DVD. You can rewind your streaming service. Um, and so what is a rewind if not a kind of do over um, in some way, some kind of messing with the chronology of things and making the uh, impossible possible. Um, so these are two early poems and I just thought I would you know, start with those and say, I think you can see here how um, suddenly the associative uh, leaping has become, pro, you know, proliferated, right? I've got like, I'm like on this thing now where I'm like, hey, if it pops into your head, put it in the poem. And, uh, and surprisingly, I feel okay with what has happened by doing that. Like all of a sudden I had this memory of visiting Marianne Moore who's, a, if you don't know, an American poet. And this, this is true. Her living room is actually, she bequeathed it to this museum and you can go see her living room with everything um, that was in there at the time of her death on display and cataloged exactly. And you, there's like a little rope in front of the doorway and you stand there and you look in. Um, but again, that seems to me like, what can we keep, right? What's, what does it mean to preserve something, right? Um, and then it's like, what's missing? So yeah, here's her living room, but Marianne Moore is not there. Um, anyway, so that that is that. Um, so I was saying that, you know, that's an ekphrastic poem. And so one of the ways that poets get outside of themselves 
is by looking at other kinds of art forms um, and, and writing about those, pulling those in. I mean, and so here um, in the Eternal City, where is it? Right here. Um, it, in the center of this book, uh, based the, the name the Eternal City refers to the city of Rome. Um, this is actually a painting of Aeneas fleeing Troy. And so he, out of running from Troy, found, you know, he then goes on to found Rome, mythologically speaking. Um, and so I think of the cover as kind of conceptual in its own weird way, but out of ruin, out of despair and loss, something lasting is built. Um, but it also has at its core a bunch of poems that are in response to the uh, Roman emperor, Marcus Aurelius slash Roman emperor slash philosopher. Um, and he had uh, a book of meditations that he wrote in his old age. And so what I did was I, I was trying to clean out my garage. And so Aurelius is a um, stoic, which means he would it's a weird weird position for a, for an emperor to have he he didn't he wanted to be as detached from material objects as possible and to be as un to be as objective and unmoved emotionally as possible um and so i tend to be really self sentimental and you know give maybe a, a like level two hoarder you know, so so when cleaning out my garage, I would read Marcus Aurelius and he would say, like, don't, you know, don't hold on to things. And then I'd run down and throw everything in the dumpster. Um, and so then I'd come upstairs and write a poem about having thrown everything in the dumpster. All right. So these were um, my Marcus Aurelius cleaning out the garage poems. Doesn't everyone have a set of those? Um, OK, book three. This is and then it has from book three of Marcus Aurelius. They know not how many things are signified by the words stealing, sewing, buying, keeping quiet, seeing what ought to be done. For this is not affected by the eyes, but by another kind of vision, Marcus Aurelius. The Quadi and the Parthians were barbarian tribes who were always attacking the perimeter. Remember the Quadi and Parthians, never allow them into your life. I got to pause again. All right. <laughs> um, at the time that I was a middle school teacher, I also spent the summers on the boardwalk in Wildwood, New Jersey, and I had a small record store, and we also sold like rock and roll accessories. So you could get a Metallica t-shirt or um, a poster of some boy band. Um, I, I still miss that life. Anyway, so in this poem, I'm still doing that. I'm selling a, uh, a Metallica t-shirt, Ride the Lightning, in fact, to Okay. Remember the Quadi and Parthians, never allow them into your life. Last night at work, before I knew it, while I was busy selling a t-shirt, the one with the glow in the dark skeleton in the electric chair to Canadian tourists, an addict convinced me to keep an eye on his six-year-old son. Slurring something as simple as don't let him go nowhere, he turned and stepped into the Congress of Night Strollers on the boardwalk. Where did he go? The child wondered. After 10 minutes, he asked, how long has he been gone? Soon though, the father returned, stood in the doorway of the shop, called his son's name once, and they vanished. In his relief, the boy forgot the jarred goldfish he'd won by tossing a coin into its bowl. At midnight, I placed it into the open hand of the sunburnt girl wearing thick black glasses, knee-high socks, and a 14-gauge surgical steel lip ring. Having lost somewhere in the past the urge to take so grave a responsibility upon myself, the fish will die. Maybe it's dead already, and I'm tired of feeling sad. What is this other kind of vision that recognizes already the end in sight, that foresees only disaster? Today, I'm giving away two bags of clothing I've never worn, and then I'm going to run in place at the gym while I listen to Moby Dick on tape. We discussed puppets and how much he likes the big blocks at school. 
we considered how slowly time seems to pass when you're waiting. So that's my other prompt now. Start with the text that you love, read the text and then write back to your text. <laughs> and so this is intertextuality. Um, and then there are these, just so you can see some other ones here. I'm not gonna read you. Uh, this is the letter to the poet Gerald Stern. And so another prompt for you would be to write a letter to someone you don't know, but admire. I'm running up against a time limit, so I'm not gonna read you this really long poem to Gerald Stern, but what I can read you is from the new book. And these, so when I was traveling abroad for a year, um, I had a fellowship that required me to do that. Um, uh, I found out that I was homesick and I was not, I've never been deeply, um, nationalistic. And so this was a revelation to me to feel homesick for America. And it's just so cold all the time. <laughs> and I wanted more hot water. I was just such a, you know, typically privileged American. <laughs> um, yeah, we turn up the heat. Um, and so, uh, so when I got back, I thought I would, I had this weird feeling about America. And this is actually a really old poem. This is from the like economic collapse of uh, 2008. Um, and this is, uh, so the, the, it mentions a presidential sound, sound bite, but that is none of the presidents that any of, of us are thinking of we, now. And this is called, this, this is a letter to America, which seemed like a good idea at the time and now seems like, what was I thinking? All right, America peaches. America, I know I could do better by you, though I stoop conscientiously three times a day to pick up my dog's waste from the grass with black biodegradable bags. And lest you suspect that this is more pretension than allegiance, no, my dog was the one at the shelter no one else would take. Fat and lazy, and I could do better by him as well. Though I do not know if a long walk in the park in 97 degree heat is a good idea. Please cue a presidential soundbite to reassure me all hearts are more resilient than I think. I confess it would have been a moral error to have embraced him if I did not have the means to keep him fed. But I am writing tonight because there's something wrong with your peaches. The ones from the supermarket are so soft and cheap, half the cost of the ones sold at the local farm but the flesh near the pit is so bitter and green. It is a fruit like the mind we are making together, both overripe and immature. Trust me, I still have the simple taste you gave me. I'm delighted by the common robins and cardinals, the way they set the trees at dusk aflame. Thank you for Tuesday's reliable trash collection. If you are constellated somehow a little bit inside each of your people, I am sorry that there is more and more of you lately. I do not understand. Sometimes I want simply to sit alone a long time in silence. America, you must want this too. Um, Beginner's Mind is another ekphrastic poem, except that rather than being, a, we often think of ekphrastic poems as being about um, static visual arts, sculptures, paintings, photographs. This is actually an ekphrastic poem about the television series, My So-Called Life. Um, if you haven't seen it, I just will give you a, uh, a plug for that one. Um, I'm not going to read it because I don't want to keep you here all day, but it stars Jared Leto and Claire Danes. So what else do you need to know? Um, I'm going to read this one, though. This is The River Twice, and it's set in Richmond, and it's a plug for The Love of Jesus, which I don't even know if it's still in business or not. But The Love of Jesus is a gigantic thrift store on the south side of Richmond on Midlothian Turnpike. Um, I, you can look it up on Facebook and see if it's still there. Uh, and this is so if Marcus Aurelius was the star of um, the Eternal City, Heraclitus is the star of um, the River Twice. And so, in fact, the River Twice gets its name from the Heraclitian, Heraclitian fragment. 
um, you can't step in the same river twice. And then the second half of that is that because it's never the same river and you're never the same person, right? And so um, I, I came up with the title, this title for the collection before I wrote any poems. <laughs> because I felt like I couldn't write it. I wanted to write a different kind of poem and I couldn't write a different kind of poem. I wanted to write these, I was gonna write these really short poems or these really formal poems. I was gonna never write a poem more than 14 lines. And then you could see that this, this isn't happening. This is not the poet that I am. And so I had to forgive myself for the voice that I had and the mind that I had and the sensibility that I had. And so I forgave myself by saying, well, it's gonna be the same the same old thing, but not really. <laughs> it's going to be a new you and it will be a new river. Okay, so this is the river twice. Um, the love of Jesus is a thrift warehouse on the south side of town. Everything inside is a dollar. On Mondays and Fridays, everything is 50 cents. On a stormy afternoon, in June, I drift for hours down the aisles, bread machines and coffee pots, shirts and shoes, tea drink stacks of mismatched dinnerware. I am studying a cup whose crackled glaze is the pale blue-green of beach glass. Two lions chase one another around its fragile eternity, the way the lover pursues the beloved on the ancient urn. Their manes and legs watched in a preternatural purple and gold. Behind me, a woman tells her son, William, to get up from the floor so she can measure him against a pair of little boy's jeans. When he doesn't rise, she tells him she's going to start counting. She says she's only going to count to two. When I look over, he is already on his feet at silent attention, his arms outstretched from his sides. I live in an attic apartment above two women who have been unemployed as long as I have known them. This week, the last of their benefits have been unexpectedly terminated by the state. A drop in the overall number of jobless automatically triggers a cessation of extensions, the letters that come in the mail explain. Outside, thunder cracks. Later, the streets will be full of limbs. Heraclitus believed that in the beginning, creation simply bubbled forth, an inevitable percolating stream, logos, both reason and word, issuing from a source unseen. Sometimes I feel a sudden sorrow, as though my own emotions were a room I'd forgotten why I entered. My mother struck me only once for refusing to put on my coat. I was four years old and she had been scrubbing motel rooms all day. I'd fallen asleep in the dark on a low shelf in the linen closet beside the boxes of little pink soaps. Today, that shelf is gone and the great white polar caps are melting. At Kasunga National Park in Malawi, a drought has caused the lions to turn on the rangers whose job it is to protect them. Our skulls are chipped bowls, broken globes, we plunge into the flow. Heraclitus, whom the crash of time has left in fragments, saw in the cosmos a harmony of tensions. Imagine the lyre, he wrote, and the bow. The store radio plays satellite gospel. A hymn with the chorus, every moment you shall be judged, is followed by one in which the choir shouts praise, stand up and be forgiven. So that's almost an ode. <laughs> that's an ode to thrift shops uh, and the complexity of our spiritual lives. Um, and let me just see, I'm gonna end. I'm gonna go all the way back. So the poems get, as the book progresses, the poems get progressively um, political, I think. How could they not, right? Writing through uh, the last four years. And so the last, there's this long poem at the end that's called a rhetoric. And um, 
Yeah, I'm not going to read this, but it is it is a, a you know I think as political a poem as I'm capable of writing at this particular moment. Um, and it ends with like a rhetoric of everyone simply wanting to stay. But I'm going to go back because I want, wanted to close by reading a pastoral in the first book um, because it's April and we are, it's green and sunshine. This is actually, I think, an anti-pastoral because it's said in Jersey City in New Jersey and it's not so great. Uh, what's, what the, the way that goats appear in this is not fabulous. But um, what I realized in hindsight, because I'm teaching form and theory of poetry this semester to undergraduates, is that, and I had, you know, I had known this but not known it, is that the pastoral is always a little bit ironic because it was never written by shepherds for shepherds, right? It was written, you know, for uh, urban dwellers, like the, the, the attendees at court and royalty um, for, for each other. Um, and the, the pastoral aspects of it, the land, natural landscape was a sort of trope. Um, pastoral. All winter, I watched the cat in the butcher's window. And now that the weather has turned and the door to new con meets stands open, I catch the whine of the electric saw, the slap of the cleaver. But because the white coated workers stand always with their backs to the street, I never have to see what's being done. To keep ourselves together, we learn to keep ourselves apart. Etched in the ancient tomb of the Queen of Ur is the image of Capra Prisca, a ram caught in a thicket. We read the breed from the I'm sorry, peculiar spiral of its horns. The indifferent gray cat, loyal only to the tough scraps from the master's block, slips out past two crates of mangoes into the warm air of the stoop. Last week, a man opened the battered back gate of an idling van and flung three flayed boats, even the heads were bare, across his shoulder, then stepped inside. The flesh was neither pink nor bloodied, but a dry articulate bank of dark muscle and pale ribbons of fat. Imagine the first spring, the fine violet flank of night descending. That's it. <laughs> Thank you all for having me. I'm really grateful uh, to be here and spend some time with you. Wow, that was such a treat and such an honor to have you read from all your volumes in one talk and such an education. Um, we have some time, folks. Um, if you'd like to post your questions in the in the chat, we can do that. Or if you'd like to just raise your hands, I can unmute you. We have some uh, colleagues in the English department who have joined us. Thank you so much for um, for being here. And um, before we we get the first question, uh, Kathy, I <laughs> I love your question. Doesn't <laughs> everyone have a set of Marcus Aurelius poems? Right? <laughs> um, the question I, I wanted to ask you was about the the uh, genealogy of these volumes, right? You talked about writing the poem "The River" twice first, and then trying to to mold the volume sort of around this poem, and then you introduced us to the you know the two elegies and the the sort of creative process driving you know your your previous volumes. Um, can you talk a little bit about the latest volume and um, if if um, if you felt anything in relation to previous now that you know you're an established poet have have you know published um, you know two volumes already have have received all this recognition does it get easier in that sense and what was the genealogy of putting the river twice together thank you no it gets harder. It doesn't, excuse me, I just had seltzer. It doesn't get easier. It gets much harder, um, at least for me. I think for other people, it might get easier. It's just, I feel like the political landscape has been so challenging. It's hard to figure out what to say into that space and who should be saying it and whose voice we should be listening to and what contribution can, what meaningful contribution can I make to that conversation? Um, and in mom some moments, I feel like, hey, I can only speak out of my own life 
as circumscribed as it may be. Um, and to aspire to do more than that is, you know, foolish um, and presumptuous. And that, that's probably wisdom, but sometimes I, I, you know, nevertheless feel like, how can you not say something? I, you know about what's going on and so that dilemma is um paralyzing to a large degree um so it has been anyway and i struggle to shake it off and we have this new word languishing i'm struggling to shake off the languishing um yeah i i've never been a fan of project books which is a, a book that has like the whole collection is sort of designed around a certain concept. And then the part you get the sense that the poet came up with this idea and then they execute the idea, even, even past the point at which that execution feels like it's fruitful um, or generating new thinking. Um, but they're, they're stuck to it and they're gonna see it through. So the, the book becomes almost as much a work of conceptual art as it is a book, a collection of poetry. And so um, I like the idea of poetic cycles. Obviously the Marcus Aurelius ones, there's a series of poems about Heraclitus. You know, the Eternal City has some um, poems about film. You know, the River Twice has some television references in it. Uh, there's some musical references. Um, the idea of a, a series, a, a sort of like circum, like shorter series of poems is good because I don't have that many good ideas. And so when I get one, I'm like, oh, I can get six poems out of this one. You know, uh, you know and then I usually only get half as many as you think you can, but you at least say like, okay, this will be good for more than one poem. Um, then I just keep writing until I think I have enough poems. This was a challenge because the press wanted the book before I really felt like I had enough poems. And so I really had to sort of, um, the joke is like take my laptop and, and shake it to see if I could find some drafts falling out that I might be able to work on to put them together. Uh, so there wasn't a, a coherent um, organizing principle outside of wanting to do Heraclitus um, and these poems about America, again, another. So usually the books will have one or two or maybe three um, series or kinds of poems that then sort of get shuffled in with some basic outliers. Mm -hmm. that helps. Did you write all the America poems while you were away? And what cold country did you go to? <laughs> oh, they're all cold in the winter. No, um, I spent a lot of time in the, the um, southwest coast of England and I lived on an organic farm and I bought the I rented this cottage, which was so charming, you know, really a renovated flower house where they used to bundle daffodils, um, you know, remotely. And this was years ago, like before um, Airbnb. And, you know, they neglected to make totally clear the fact that it's sort of a piece of wood burning stove. So I remember really walking in and like being like, okay, great, great. Yeah, I love it. Kitchen's great. Love it. Love it. Where's the thermostat? <laughs> you know? And the farmer, you know, laughing, you know, to himself and then pointing to this wood burner. And I'm like, oh, okay. And I'm like, where's, well, where's the cord of wood? And he's like, points to the saw, <laughs> you know? So yeah, that was, that was a lot of those there. And then from there, I, I started asking around, like, where can I go to be warm? And in the UK, people go to Malta. So I went to Malta, from the UK to Malta, you know, and then, you know, traveled to other European cities. But even in Malta in January, it's, it's pretty darn cold. <laughs> So did you write all the, all the poems in the America cycle? Oh, I wrote them when I got Just back. Poem. Uh -huh. I wrote that one when I got back. That's one of the first poems that I wrote um, for this collection. In fact, uh, I wrote it in Richmond. It was one of my first Richmond poems. Uh, yeah. yeah, it was only like I, once I got back, I realized that I had this sort of, um, I don't know, filial feeling about, to the country. And I sort of, but I saw it as deeply um, ill, right? Mm -hmm. This tragically mm -hmm. ill, parent figure that I was sort of sitting in their death room and what did I what could I say to them I was like well you know let me hold your hand it hasn't been great between us but you know 
I don't think you always, you know, yeah, I don't know. I was like, you had, you seem to have had such promise at various points, <laughs> you know, what yeah. wrong? Yeah. So that, I think that was my, my feeling was like, oh yeah, I could see how I was naively optimistic or blind or something. So all there was a lot of complicated feelings, but, um, it was interesting that they weren't wasn't pure rage and that was more that was interesting to me that there was a sort of tenderness to the idea of the country and the geography and the actual land of the country mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thank you it's a beautiful poem um we have uh, just a few questions and uh, we'll we'll end in just a few minutes but um i just wanted to read from angela apt's note to oh you. yes uh, she says, no question, just a thank you. Great format, craft with Kathy. And she also writes, and love of Jesus opens at 9 a.m. tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. I can't, I, I think it has gotten like, it's changed a lot. I don't think everything in there is a dollar anymore. <laughs> Thank you for this, Angela. We have a question uh, from um, Adin Lears, first our colleague in English, and then uh, one from Greg Donovan. So um, Adin, please go ahead. Hi, can, can everybody hear me? Adin. Uh, yes. I yes can we hear can. You. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Kathy, for these insights into your process. And I'm really um, so struck by your uh, your kind of grab bag magpie approach to writing poetry and um th this idea sorry my cat's crying for dinner in the background i don't know if that's audible we're used to that but, now this is <laughs> um the idea that if you have an idea while you're writing it should probably be in the poem and this is actually not that far from um how I approach writing literary criticism and um, essays. And so I'm, I'm wondering if this approach to poetry informs how you do other writing um, or um, perhaps how you teach. I know you taught 301 at one point and I'm interested if, um, if it informed your approach to teaching criticism in 301. I think that um, my students will probably probably say, I think they find me disorganized. <laughs> and I don't think that it is not because I intend, it's not because I'm actually disorganized or don't have a plan um, or they'll find me tangential. But I, you know, I like to follow the conversation in the classroom where it goes. And I like to follow, I like a student-centered classroom and I like them to pursue their passions and their interests and their, um, you know, fascinations or an exhilaration, moments of exhilaration in the text. And that's not always predictable to me. And so I, I will often go in, you know, and I'm always holding up for my students. I'm like, look, look, I do have notes. I have like, I'm prepared to talk about things today, right? So I'll have a list of things I want to talk about. And I do try to make a point of getting to those things. Um, but I'm, but I'm perfectly fine for the court, for the class to end up talking like, maybe we, I wasn't planning that. I didn't see this text as a text that was really about gender. And then suddenly someone says, well, don't you think that this is sort of gendered? And then I'm like, well, now that you pointed out, I do. <laughs> and so the course, the class sort of goes this way or goes that way. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, but I do, I think I, I learned this. Um, so one of the other things that, um, mm -hmm like besides for Joseph Cornell was years of teaching composition. And I, I taught in a very experimental program at NYU composition program that was very much about leaping and uh, what we would now call creative nonfiction. And so I think my poems have been called essayistic. And, you know, 20 years ago, that was an insult. <laughs> and now, and now it's sort of like, more of a just neutral descriptor or something like that. Um, it might even be like, oh, they're hybrid, which would be like way cool. So, <laughs> yeah, that's great. It it um it I really like the idea that these sort of constellations of ideas that you mentioned can sort of make their way into the classroom as well um, in um, uh, pursuing interpretations of literature. So, thank you. 
Yeah, I was, I guess one of the things I would say is, is like, sometimes you'll have sort of like two or three ideas about a text, right, that are going on in your head simultaneously. And what I challenge my students sometimes to do is to write a paragraph in which they explain how those ideas are connected. Um, it's not always easy, but sometimes you can, I mean, I can write my way to understanding that intuitive thing so I trust the intuition and then let make the conscious mind do some digging yeah you know that i don't have to tell you <laughs> thank you aiden thanks kathy for your answer uh greg i think you may have just answered my question can you hear me yes i can okay uh, but uh I, i'm, I'm going to pretend i'm asking this for my students but actually it's for me uh, how do you tell when a strand you're importing into a braided poem like that is actually not going to work well and integrate with it? Or do you decide simply to refuse to give up on it until it finds its home there through your own inventive work on it? No, I do give up on some of them. I think I should give up on more of them than I do. I think I went <laughs> overboard in, uh, you know, I, it, so there's like a sweet spot, right? Like trust your intuition and there's like a little sweet spot in there. And then I may have, uh, I think that in this last collection, I may have trusted my intuition one or two steps too far. Um, yeah, I, I think what I do, what I used to do, and I think it's a good practice is after I would get a draft and I like to draft a poem from beginning to end if I can in, in one sitting. Even, you know, even if the end is a bad ending, I just, I'd like to get as much of the poem. I'd like to get the arc of the poem and then I may add things or take things out. But anyway, I'd like to at least get this art, the like general blueprint down. Um, and then what I would, and then after I tinker with it for a while, I, I would ask myself to explain what's holding the poem together. Like, okay, if there is some kind of subject below the subject, what is it? Can you articulate it to yourself, right? And so if I can't even explain it to myself, that's probably a problem, right? There's probably something wrong there. Um, and so, and, but if I can halfway articulate it to myself, then that acts as a sieve through which like all of the ingredients have to pass. And if they can't make it through that screen, like they're not a part of that self-identified constellation of concerns, then they there might be a reason why they don't, the poem feels clunky or off or too long or too digressive. Um, and then this is gonna sound like really hokey, but not to you, Greg, but to other people perhaps, but sometimes this is a big clue, right? You're going along and all of a sudden you hit like, it's like you've hit a series of potholes in your own poem. And you're like, this is just like, I just cannot get these couple of lines right here to sound right. They just sound off. And sometimes the sonic offness is a weird symptom of a thematic uh, discord. So I'm like, what happens if I cut those? I can't get them to work. What happens if I cut them? Oh, the poem's better. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. And thank you. Thanks, Greg. Um, we have time for just one more question uh, from Caroline Cahill in Oregon. And uh, uh, she students. So Angela and Caroline. So yes. Yeah, and she has a question that I wanted to ask, but she formulated it so much better. So, uh, Caroline, if you can, if you uh, can unmute yourself, please go ahead and ask your yes. question. Hi, Kathy. Hi. Um, you you had mentioned that uh, Aurelius was the star of the Eternal City, and um, Heraclitus is the star of the River Twice. So, I was just wondering what stars are currently infusing your work. I don't have any star <laughs> using my work right now. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I've been thinking about that a lot. Um, yeah, I have, I have, uh, I have fleeting, fleeting ideas, but yeah, I don't have a definite. I, th I think that words may be the stars of the next one. I'm really interested okay. in prepositions. 
and usage, weird usage. I've been getting more and more interested in the quirkiness of the language. And so I think the last poem in The River Twice, that rhetoric poem is very much about playing with words and, the, and word play. And, um, and so I'm, I'm thinking a lot about, about that. And I think that, um, I don't know, COVID has done some, something about that. It's like this, this rupture in time. And I'm not going away. I'm going into, I'm in the deep stuff now, down in the weeds. Uh, but there's something about prepositions that orchestrate the, the, our experience of time and adverbs. And so like words like previously and, you know, through the word through is really interesting, like getting through, passing through. So um, yeah, that's what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about these words and writing sort of poems that are, that just have these weird little words as their titles. I'm excited to read it. <laughs> we'll see about that. <laughs> oh, it's good to hear you. Thank you too. You Thank you, Caroline. Um, unfortunately, we have to say goodbye, but this was such a treat, Kathy. Thank you, such, Christina. Such a wonderful experience. And, um, you know, the audience members have the link to the, your publisher's website. Um, our library has access to your ebook if they want to go right to the website of the library and read it now, <laughs> the, your latest volume. And I'm just so grateful to all of you for, for taking time from this beautiful day and uh, joining us. Um, and um, a quick reminder, I have to do this as HRC director, our next, so this concludes our Need VCU authors on such a high note. Thanks to you, Kathy. And um, I just wanted to remind audience members that um, our next event will be on May 6th, a graduate student mini symposium on critical race theory. These are grad students in English. And then on May 12th, a virtual open house for Humanity Research Center faculty members, and you're all invited. Thank you all for spending this time with us today and for um, supporting the humanities at VCU and for helping us celebrate the almost end of Poetry Month. Have a great rest of the week and see you next time. Thanks so much, Kathy. Thank you.